And now it is my pleasure to introduce Julie Weston. Uh, Julie's publications include three award-winning mysteries sent in the 1920s in Idaho. Um, her most recent one is Moonscape, which takes place at Craters of the Moon. And she did a presentation a few months back um, on, uh, on that book. And I was just saying before we started that after that talk, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't keep the book on the shelves. It just kept getting checked out and checked out and checked out. So uh, she's also written a memoir of place about an Idaho mining town. Her awards include honorable mention in the 2009 Idaho Book of the Year Award, the 2017 Willa Literary Award for Historical Fiction, the 2019 Idaho Writers Conference Nonfiction Memoir Competition winner, and the 2019 Bronze Forward Indies Award for Mystery. So um, congratulations for uh, your writing and all those awards, Julie. And then um, with her tonight is her husband, uh, uh, Jer Gary Morrison. Uh, Gary's photographs have been published on book covers and in magazines. He describes trying to capture those special moments when light is painting a scene in a unique or a particularly attractive way. Landscapes, people, still lives or flowers come to life with light and that is why he photographs. And I assure you that as you as this presentation proceeds and you see his photographs, you'll clearly see that interplay between light and form and the delight that he takes in that. So um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Julie Weston and Gary Morrison. Thank you very much for coming here tonight. Yay. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you and the library for hosting us. We are in fact at the library since <laughs> Uh, we have trouble getting any kind of uh, Zoom reception at our house. We get knocked off all the time because uh, we live up a canyon. This is our new coffee table book, The Magical Universe of the Ancients, a desert journal. And it includes our travels in the Southwest a while ago. We decided to publish it now because of the various attacks on monuments in the Southwest and in some national parks. Uh, mostly for oil and gas interests. We want very much to try and preserve this area of our country, um, these wild areas, and so we have this published and we're uh, encouraging people not only to read it, but to contact some of the agencies who are um, challenging the various um, interests in the, mostly the Department of the Interior who, has who have tried to reduce them there areas available for public access. I'm going to now share the screen with the PowerPoint so you can see some of the pictures. And go back. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, but it doesn't show the chronology. Oh, try the um, try the arrow button. Ah, there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, first are two uh, quotes for, that inspired us as we worked along from Edward Abbey. The idea of wilderness needs no defense. It only needs defenders. And we consider ourselves part of the defenders. And Ansel Adams, you probably know, know him as a world famous photographer. He said, I believe the world is incomprehensibly beautiful, an endless prospect, prospect of magic and wonder. And I think we all feel that way about our area in the Wood River Valley, and that's certainly true of the Southwest. In the book, we talk a lot about the chronology and um, you'll see some of the pictures that relate back to various areas. The early ancients were the archaic hunters and gatherers in 8500 BCE, which refers to before the Common Era. And if you add 2000 years of uh, our uh, AD or Common Era, that's actually 10,000 years ago. And in the next category, the basket maker two and three and agricultural beginnings were in 1500 BCE, 
again, if you add 2,000 years to that, it's about 3,500 years ago. Um, there are now uh, Pueblo 1 and 2 and Pueblo 3. Uh, this, these whole um, categories were once called Anasazi, and now they're referred to as ancestral Puebloans, mostly, except for the archaic numbers. The Colorado Plateau, where we spent a considerable amount of time, was continuously occupied for at least 5,000 years and possibly as far back as 10,000 years. Um, we began our journeys with arches, and I'm going to read part of the book from the introduction. Congress establishes national parks. Presidents under the Antiquities Act can declare national monuments. The first park, as you probably know, was Yellowstone National Park. The first monument declared by Theodore Roosevelt was Devil's Tower, Wyoming. Since the first monument, nearly every president has used the Antiquities Act to establish national monuments throughout the country. Wilderness areas are also established by Congress. Each designation has its own particular boundaries and rules, often administered by the National Park Service, which is a division of the Department of Interior. Many states have a national park. Idaho only has a national monument. Unfortunately, now many of the areas we visited and others are under attack from outside sources. An administration is kowtowed to developers and oil interests, oil companies, and their lobbyists, Utah politicians, and other interests who appear to worship only profits and development. National monument areas have been more than decimated, almost completely eliminated. Sacred tribal areas are being ignored and just desecrated with motorized vehicles. Lawsuits have been filed to stop some of the worst decisions and actions. Our fear is that our children and grandchildren will lose these treasures. For that reason, we decided to memorialize our travels and photographs. If nothing else, we can preserve our visual and internal reactions in this our desert journey. In Utah, we drove south through a wide flat valley north of Moab, remarkable for its empty beauty. A long rampart of white rock ran parallel with the highway to the west, matched by a lofty red stone wall in the east, marking the borders of Arches National Park. We passed the signs to Canyonland Arches, Castle Valley, and the Mole Geranium Line, and drove into Moab, at that time a collection of Sydney motels, gas stations, souvenir shops and cars, buses, and RVs. We weren't the only ones on the road trip. After stocking up on bottled water, we drove back into Arches. How many shades of red can there be? Blood red, salmon red, coral, pink, cinnamon red, vermilion, scarlet, and more. The varying tones blend from one to the other and defy the accurate description. Almost immediately, we saw the three gossips, tall columns of rock with stone heads, listening to each other. And that's the first uh, photograph there. And they do look like people gossip. Julie, a couple of people have mentioned that um, they're having a hard time hearing you. So um, maybe bring the um, computer a little closer to you or, or turn your computer volume up a little bit. Yeah, I brought it closer. I'll just speak That louder. helps a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. A Jeep road lured us from the heavily traveled thoroughfare of the park. We peeled off the pavement and headed northwest to the Klondike Bluffs. Red dust lifted briefly as we passed, then settled everywhere. Ruts remained from the last rain, which had turned the roads into mire, then dried. Thunderheads flowered from the horizon. At the end of the dirt road was a true Jeep road. A small Toyota truck preceded us, aiming its nose to the sky over rocks and paths even goats might find difficult. We followed. The shocks on our Jeep, and it was a Chrysler Jeep type automobile, moaned, squeaked, and groaned. I winced in sympathy. Up, up we climbed to a flat top and views of marching men. That's the photograph on the right. Crossing the desert in eternal, majestic 
aloneness. Columns of rock with helmeted heads pressed together as if in lockstep, eager for engagement. We continued down a steep rock face. When we dropped off into the soft red sand, Gary and I looked at each other. And I must say, it was almost like this. Scared the hell out of me. Maybe we should turn around, he said. I nodded. In silence, he backed and filled until we faced the return trip. The Jeep tires plowed through the sand and up the rock without hesitation. On top again, we rested the car as if it were a horse, ate lunch, and watched the marching men, waiting to see if one misstepped and fell out of line, crumpled from heat, dropped the count. None did, of course. I thought of marching in my high school band when I played the flute. Our desert journal is not intended as archeological, cultural, or geological guide, or even a political cry for help, but rather a preservation of a world that may mostly disappear under oil rigs, ATVs, fracking equipment, and too many people. We present photographs and recount our adventures and speculate on information we heard or have read as a result of our travels. As we traveled and explored, Gary photographed and I wrote. Mystery walked with us every day. How did the ancient peoples live? What did their art mean? Did it reflect a magical universe where real and unreal converge? How did they access some of the higher reaches to build houses and paint or pack their art into the rock campuses? What happened to them? These questions continue to lure us into the desert. This, our desert journal, recounts our continuing love affair with the desert Southwest. May that love be perpetuated in all of our children and grandchildren, and may these treasures be preserved, if not in fact, then in this journal for others to enjoy. Here is a picture, which is also on the front of the book called Yen A'a, and Gary's gonna talk about how he took the photographs. Thank you, Julie. Let me put on my reading glasses so I can actually take a look at my notes. I learned to photograph when I was 16 in 1954 at Roosevelt High School in Seattle. Cameras were simple in those days. 35 millimeter lens, black and white roll film. You had to develop in a dark room and enlarge the pictures that you selected. From then on, I had a dark room in each house I lived in. Sometimes it was a closet, sometimes a basement bathroom, and later an actual space with sinks and enlargers. I never used color film except Kodak's Kodachrome, which came back from a processor in slide film. At some point in the 1980s, I became entranced with Ansel Adams and his work. He used a very large format camera that shot pictures on eight inches by 10 inches film. Each sheet of film was loaded in a film holder in his dark room, and the holder was put in, and a single holder was put into the camera after the shot was set up. I learned that very good pictures could be taken by a similar four, and a, four by five inch camera and bought one used. It was a Linhoff Technica. It was what I used to take all the used to take all the black and white images for a book. I'm going to hold it up here shortly for, the, for you to see what it looked like. Maybe hold it back just a little bit, Gary, so they can see the whole thing. Yeah, uh huh. That's great. Okay. Needless to say, it was heaven. The camera, film, lenses, black cloth, and I'll show you that. This is a black cloth. And it you put over the camera when you're looking at the image on the back screen. <laughs> it 
it may be white on the outside, but it's very heavy because you don't want it to blow away when you're taking the take, when you're setting up the picture to take the, the, the shot. <clears throat> the most important feature of these cameras, however, was when you look at the screen, what you saw, like Kenyaha again, upside down. It's upside down and actually inverted. And I had never, before I used this camera, been able to understand why that was so important. But what's important about it is it teaches you about composition because it's not what you're seeing with your eyes. It's upside down and inverted. So you learn composition with that. When the image is not what you see, the image is not what you see looking directly at the scene. You notice all the elements and can adjust the view to take a scene like a painter might. Once the camera is set on the scene, then you use a spot meter. This is a spot meter. And you aim at the dark spots in the scene, not through the camera, but outside the camera. And you set the exposure by doing that. And the reason you, you aim at the dark spots is that they are the hardest ones to deal with in the dark room. The very bright spots, you can, you can uh, reduce the brightness, but you can't increase the darkness. That's with the digital, it's a little different now. <laughs> hard part of using this is the weight. The film, the camera, the lenses, black cloth weighed about 40 pounds and it had to be set on a tripod. But it wasn't light either, so the combination was probably 50 pounds. And uh, carrying that on your back up and down in the wilderness area, whether it's here in the Wood River Valley or where we were in Monument Valley, it, it was not easy. No, no, I want to talk about this one. With Julie's help carrying the tripod often, I carried the pack. And our llama settled, sat. <laughs> We could make it work. And I did it for about a decade. As I grew older and digital photography advanced, I gave up using film and heavy cameras and dark rooms. And I use one camera for black and white and color images, a computer, and a nice printer to produce black images. Much simpler now, but it's not a whole lot more fun. So let's talk about some pictures. Uh, our first chapter is called Cold Cold Kelly Song. And these are a couple of images in the Bears Ears Monument area. The first one is called an eggshell ruin. The eggshell ruin was one of my most inspiring uh, uh, pictures, primarily because of the, the complexity of the scene above the um, the, the, uh, the ruin itself, which is a little place where the ancients lived. But it's just so round and, and, and wonderful to look at. And when I saw it upside down and inverted, I realized this was a grand picture. And then you see the dark spots in the back. That's where you where you uh, use your uh, spot meter to set your images and set the time in the in the, uh, in the screen. And the, the photograph on the right was uh, partially an arch and rock structure there. Uh, the Cocopelli is the figure in the rock art lying on its back, blowing a flute. The Cocopelli is, is a myth, some, somewhat like a coyote in some other uh, tribal uh, imageries, and it reflects the mythology of some of the ancient peoples. Uh, we saw a number of ruins and uh, 
rock art and petroglyphs that are not available in most guidebooks or uh, available to people. So we were careful not to disclose the locations of most of these. The same is true of the one on the left here. This is Mule Canyon. On, uh, Gary was on a workshop at one point and was introduced to this ruin and was, made a promise not to show it to anybody but to me. And so when we went down this area, Gary took me and, and we had to hike quite a ways off any road uh, on an unbeaten path and we took this photograph. This one was uh, one of the few black and er, color shots that I probably used for a, um, a film camera that, and I think it was a Kodachrome. In the same area, but uh, in this photo on the right, uh, were other uh, examples of rock art. That This one is a Seagull Canyon, which is right off the main highway, and there are signs pointing to it. These figures all look to all of us and to other people, I'm sure, like space people. They were high up in the canyon. And this picture right here shows you where they are in the canyon. Um, and if you look at this photograph, I'm down in the lower left corner in front of uh, one of the play cards that you could read. And then um, the small part of the picture up on the right is on the, this high wall. We never could figure out how some of these were done. Uh, th there were no obvious ways of getting up that high. And uh, there wasn't an obvious crack or something that might have um, broken off. So that's part of our magical universe. Maybe they flew up. <laughs> Another chapter deals with geology in the area. Uh, the one on the left here is the Devil's Garden in the Escalante. And the Escalante is another one of the national monuments is being uh, reduced in size by an unbelievable amount. Uh, I asked Gary to put this in because it reminded me of a Star Wars movie. The one on the right is Bryce Canyon, and Gary took this uh, under a full moon. All the, the uh, geological structures are called hoodoos. If you've been to Bryce Canyon, you probably recognize them. You can walk down amongst them, and they are all different colors. Um, there's cinnamon red and scarlet and uh, vermilion red and coral and salmon. The, the colors are just amazing. Gary, do you want to talk about how you took the photo? <laughs> well, one of the benefits, one of the, one of the benefits of having a large format camera and putting it on a tripod is you can expose the, your image for up to a minute or even longer. So the only question was, what would I do? And so I measured the dark parts that you can see in the back or in the lower part, upside down and inverted, of course, it was backwards. <laughs> but, but you expose them, and then you just open your lens and set your timer to leave the lens open until you've got an image that you can print. And as you can see, the moon leaves lots of shadows, which generated the title of one of my mysteries, Moon Shadows. Uh, while we were there, there were buses that stopped with lots of people. Um, and the signs were all in French, German, and I think Japanese. Many of the, the people who came out of the um, German bus had high heels on, and the men had leather soled shoes, and they walked a lot of these paths. I don't know how they did it, because we had hiking boots on. One of the main areas we visited um, in Utah and New Mexico was the Chaco culture. The, the photo on the left is the Great Kiva of the Aztec ruins, which are near Farmington. They're misnamed. Uh, there were no Aztecs around this part of the country, but the people who discovered these ruins thought the Aztecs had come up from Mexico. They did not. Um, these ruins were built from a period of 1100 to 1300. Um, and and they haven't all been excavated. Many are just left where they are um, underground, basically, to protect them. Uh, 
uh, this particular cable was rebuilt so that we could see what it would look like other, um, if we had lived during that time. On the right is a Pueblo Bonito, which is in the Charper Culture Canyon in uh, New Mexico. The foundations are three to four feet wide, so clearly they were planning on building more than one story, and they did. Um, it's, it's walls are sandstone um, rocks that were sized uh, stones that were brought in, probably from nearby for most of them, but all the wood that was brought in for um, roofs were brought in from quite a while away, quite a ways away. Here are more uh, pictures of the Chapo culture area. The left is, uh, again, Pueblo Bonito, and you can see it's more than one story high. One on the right is Chetro Kettle. Um, all of these structures were built to take advantage of uh, the light at various times of year. They clearly knew about solstices and the moon and uh, the Pueblo Benito was structured to, um, towards the summer equinox. Uh, and they divided the year and the Pueblo in half. So it's like a big D. Um, yet some of the others were used astronomical life, astronomical information to have light come through certain windows during the solstices. And uh, they were built um, north and south or east and west. That astronomical information had to pass down from generation to generation. Uh, it, it's as if the Lewis and Clark expedition had passed all of its information down to us now by word of mouth from generation to generation. Our two of the, the last two chapters in the good portion of the book were our travels in the Grand Gulch in the Colorado Plateau. Uh, the first slide here is as we're, we're going in. And we went with an outfitter. Uh, the llamas carried our, uh, our, our packs and Gary's camera. Actually, Gary carried no, his carried camera. camera. <laughs> but all of, all of, the, all of the, the other stuff we had was carried on the on the llamas and that certainly made it easier traveling. Um, one of the first ruins we saw was uh, called Jailhouse Ruin and that's the slide on the right. Uh, you can see the little bars in the window and that's what gave it the name. Um, there was lots of rock art, there were lots of ruins and one, one of our outfitters was named Joe Paycheck. And he was a botanist, a biologist, an, art, art, an artist. He knew uh, architecture. He was just an amazing man. And you can see him helping me along one of the steep cliffs. I'm a little afraid of heights. And I thought, I can't do this. And he said, oh, Julie, it's a piece of cake. <laughs> so he helped me and made sure I didn't fall down that steep uh, wall there. And you can see in back how far, how high the top was and really how far we still had to go. He talked about the art in the vicinity as presenting aspects of daily life. Corn cobs, birds, hunters, desert big corn sheep, which is a common figure, anthropomorphs, a human shape, often with a headdress resembling earphones and flute players. A precisely drawn double-sided anthropomorph like a jack or queen of spades on a face card represents a co-relating duo, according to Joe. Handprints and three, three human figures with finely painted necklaces and sashes accompany the duo as if they were spectators. On green and white bodiless heads with loops over the top, more skin masks decorated in arched overhang. On either side of the mask, more hand prints suggested laying on the hands. And when I refer to skin mask, Joe indicated that, that some of the masks that are uh, depicted in the rock art were actually made from skin of, he's not sure whether they're shamans or victims of uh, conflicts or what it was, but the whole idea of it bothered me a lot. 
much of the yard. Julie, yeah. Julie, excuse me, could you speak up again just a little bit, yes. a little bit more? Thank you. Much of the art and some aspects of your dwellings appear to emphasize the fertility of plants, animals, and people. In the magical universe, Joe explains, the ritual act of drawing herds, whether of desert bighorn sheep or turkeys, can cause the animals to increase in number. The drawing of long lines of corn can increase the harvest. The practice of placing one drawing or packing as an overlay on top of another, on top of a third, people, sheep, turkeys, and they also represent fertility. These superimposed figures or sets could also represent ritual activity. A mystery accompanying these sets is that the original drawing can be thousands of years older than one placed over it, suggesting homage being paid to earlier artists or inhabitants. Joe believes the rock art in southeastern Utah was drawn by people who believed in a magical universe. On the right is something that was called green face. High on a wall under a protective overhang, a green stripe crosses the eyes and mouth of a painted face. Yellow stripes alternate with the green. Red colors, the bobbed hair on either side of the head. Joe speaks in low tones. This is a basket maker drawing of a mask made from human skin. See the loop at the top? The handle was for carrying. I wonder again how skin was pulled from a human's head and imagine the riff like carrying parchment. The sun dips behind the sandstone walls, surrounding us in the narrow canyon, softening the light so the rock art gleams in the shadows. If this were 2,000 years ago, an artist or shaman might climb up from the water holes below, a skin mask hanging from his belt, to perform a sacred ritual. None of us want to disturb any spirits that hover in the twilight guarding the face. I don't want to meet a ghost haunting the image of its own face. We're still in the Grand Gulch. The picture on the left was called Polly's Face, and it was a giant cliff. This was the last day of our first trip. And again, you could see the height of not only the face, but the, the uh, cliffs in the back. To the right was the beginning of our second trip into the Grand Gulch, again, with the same outfitters. It was a year later um, and on with llamas. On the right is something called Big Man Panel. And you can see the, the hand prints up in the corner. And these figures were giant. We probably were approximately the size of a little uh, figure in white. This is called the banister ruin, partly because there's a banister along it. And it was quite high. We couldn't get up to it. We could only take the photo. Uh, the book, of course, has lots more photos of, of the Grand Gulch and the other things we talked about. The last picture of us is with Seth, one of the llamas who hummed the whole time we were hiking, um, as if he were worried. When we camped, he'd sit down with his um, legs turned underneath him, folded underneath him like a cat, and he stopped humming. Joe Paycheck uh, knew so much about the rock art, and we had seen on our way in uh, at the edge of the Cedars Museum in Blanding, Utah, that he had done one of the panels uh, of the rock art. And so we asked if he ever did uh, private commissions, and he said he did. Uh, so he came to our house in Indian Creek and did this mural. Um, the first slide shows how he did it, um, making a, a mask form and then painting over it and then taking it off. And we chose figures together as to what to put up. And all of the ones in the panel on the right uh, are actual drawings that are in the, the uh, Four Corners area. And in the bottom on the right there, you can see a, a Coco Pelli for his flute, and then um, handprints, and those are our handprints. 
So um, let me read the very last part. Last night um, in the uh, Rand Gulch, Joe said, I have something special to show you. With those words, he led me and two others on a hike up Falls Trail Canyon, a side route leading away from our camp. We scrambled across rocks through vines and under, undergrowth. I wore topsiders and uh, one of the other fellows was in sandals, both inappropriate footwear, yet welcome relief from boots. The light was fading, but our slightly tipsy sensibilities didn't care. At last, we reached a fragment of Eden. From a centuries old seat of water, green leaves and tiny exquisite white columbine grew under a rock overhang. They gleamed like stars. Around midnight, I rose to gaze up at the real stars. I knew a comet might be visible, and I, so I took my binoculars with me. There in the west-southwest sky, two smudges shone. With the binoculars, I find the faint comet NEAT, N-E-A-T, and above it, the hundreds of stars in the Beehive constellation. Another tenuous connection, this one with the Beehive granary, which we had seen on our travels. Above me, the stars are billions of miles and millions of years away. And around me, the rocks and ruins are millions and thousands of years old. I might be a speck of the red sand we walk through each day, but it doesn't matter. For that moment, I, a woman of Earth, saw infinity. Our book is available at Iconoclast Books in Haley in Chapter 1 in Ketchum. You could also order it from bigwoodbooks.com. You go to the contact page and amazon.com also has it. We have in the book a list of places who are helping to save the Red Rock country. Um, here, here's the list. They're all um, nonprofit groups. One is a tribal group. Uh, Western Watersheds Project in the right, lower right, is, a, is basically a local group. They are fighting to save the Bears Ears, which has experienced an 83% reduction from uh, 1.3 million acres and 100,000 archaeological and cultural sites to 7,230,000 7, acres. Uh, Escalante has been reused in half. Um, oil and gas leases are let out nearly every every month. Uh, some of them have been stopped, but mostly they're, they're being uh, continued. So I have two quotes for you. One from Nicholas Kristof. The wilderness reminds us that we humans are temporary custodians of lands held in trust for future generations. Wild places accentuate geological time, reassuring us that present crises will pass, but also impressing upon us the need to address long-term assaults that would be irreversible. And the last quote I want to read to you is from Wallace Stegner. I think most of you are familiar with him. He's a writer, a um, Western writer. Something, we, something will have gone out of us as a people if we ever let the remaining wilderness be destroyed. We need wilderness preserved, as much of it as is still left, and as many times, because it was the challenge against which our character as a people was formed. We simply need that wild country available to us even if we never do more than drive to its edge and look in. Where it can be a means of reassuring ourselves of our sanity as creatures, a part of the geography of hope. And that's the end of our presentation. We'd be happy to take questions. I think I'll unshare this.
Great, thank you. Um, that was really lovely. Um, and for those of you uh, here, you might want to click uh, gallery view on the upper right hand corner if you want to see everybody that's here. Um, uh, we've got a small enough group that you can probably unmute yourself to ask your questions. Um, while you're doing all that, uh, I have a question. Um, do either of you know what uh, was used for that um, brilliant color green on that facial image, that mask image? Um, I'm used to seeing blacks and browns and reds and whites, but not kind of a chartreuse green. Do you have any idea where, where that color came from? Um, I don't think we learned that. Possibly copper, uh, which shows up green in natural areas. Um, all the colors, of course, were from natural sources because they were all put up there a long, long time ago. Um, the red, I know, is from hematite. I often thought it was from berries or blood, but uh, Joe told us it was from hematite, which is a, a mineral. And of course, copper is a mineral. So that's that. Partly the, for some reason, that just glowed. And, it really was scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a, an odd color like to see in the desert like that. Right. And then Gary, I have a, a favor to ask of you. Um, some people didn't have their gallery view on when you were showing your camera and the different um, uh, implements that you use to, uh, to take pictures with your um, four by five. Would you mind holding your camera up again and just, you know, briefly talking about that? It's not often that you get to see a four by five camera too. Yeah, so there is a four by five camera. This is the way it looks like from the front. This is the way it looks like from the back where, you, where your image shows up on the screen. There. <laughs> and then, uh, you use this device, which is a spot meter, to measure the light. And that's what you use to measure the, the dark areas to, yes. to base your pictures on? Yes, and then uh -huh. this is the, uh, the film. You load the film in there and you put that in this part of the camera. <laughs> Pull the slide out when you're ready to take the picture. Mm -hmm. if, if, if you read Moon Shadows, I've got a full description of how you do that. Okay. Because yeah. <laughs> Gary gave it to me. Yeah. And, and Julie's mystery solver was a woman taking pictures in the 1920s, and this is the kind of a camera you would use. Not oh, this oh. kind of one. Earlier version. Does Moon yeah. Shadows take place in Bryce? Isn't no, it takes place in Haley and Ketchum. Oh, okay. But the picture that um, you took with the moon, wasn't that in Bryce Canyon? Yes, yes. that was yeah. Bryce Canyon. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, that, that was my favorite of all the pictures you showed. I thought that okay. was me. <laughs> Is Tony asleep? <laughs> He's resting. <laughs> <laughs> I had a long day, Gary. Okay, that's all right. You can sleep if you want. I was so inspired by your book uh, that, uh, well, you know, I, we took a trip to Bears Ears and Canyonlands recently. We did a big long road trip down through there and um, we saw some of the sites that you mentioned. And one thing I was struck by was the uh, extraordinary um, skill of the very ancient rock art makers. And uh, the ones that were the highest up on the wall, the ones that, you know, were very um, inspired in their design and, and very uh, finely executed. And it really seemed like, you know, from 8,000 years ago on, it was all downhill. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. It got, you know, the artwork got a little looser and a little less, um, oh, I, you know, I, I know beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but it just seemed less aesthetically 
uh, pleasing and actually less modern and less contemporary. This very, very old rock art was uh, really extraordinary. I think, um, you know, as I say, it just got, it seemed to be less careful as time went on with their motifs and, and how finely detailed they were. I don't know if anyone has remarked that or had any audition. I'm losing. Um, uh, one of the thoughts that I've, one of the theories I've heard about that rock art that's so high, um, most all of them are found in canyons and you're working um, and they're very much in areas that are very susceptible to water and wind erosion. And so um, the theory I've heard is that when they were done, the canyon bottom was much higher and since it was done, it had been washed away both by rain and wind so that the bottom of the canyon is getting lower. And so obviously the rock out would be higher. Yes, that would explain some, some of what we saw, not all. Cindy, that makes, that makes sense. And that's what our assumption was too. Not just magic. <laughs> Well, we a title. <laughs> um, one other question. I had a couple of questions. Um, you know, I first learned about the, the ancient people in the Southwest as the Anasazi, um, which I, I love the word. I don't know. There's something about the way it rolls off my tongue. It just feels good in my mouth. And now it's called the Puebloan, Puebloan, Puebloan Ancestral, Ancestral Puebloans. But yes, um, and I, I do you know why they changed that name, that, that descriptive name? The, from the theory I heard was that the word Anasazi came from the Navajo and it meant bad people. Oh, okay. So they wanted, and, and the, the um, descendants of that, those tribes were basically Pueblo and they were Hopi, Zuni, Pueblo. And so they call them ancestral Pueblo ones. Much harder to say. Yeah. It is for me. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Julie and Gary. Uh, Jerry, I really enjoyed your presentation. Very and beautiful pictures. And uh, I'm looking forward to looking at the book, too. I'll get it probably out of the library. I'm going yeah, now. Well, um, the Haley Public Library doesn't have coffee table books, but the uh, community library has. Because okay. we're a small library, we, we have to conserve our space. And apparently a couple of years ago, that was a decision that was made not to purchase any new coffee table books. Oh, OK. Well, I have a library card at both. So I will get it out of the community library. Thank you for letting me know that. Sure, sure. Anybody okay. else have questions or just comments? I, I imagine several of you have been down in that area and maybe want to share an experience or just say hello? <laughs> I'm saying goodbye. <laughs> okay. Bye, Cindy. And thank, thank you all. You. Kristen, thank you so much for Thanks, hosting. For sure. sure. Person, it's sure. been fun to do this, and it's always fun to show our, our photographs, Gary's photographs. Mm -hmm. um, these were just a small part. Um, we didn't want it to last too long. We could have gone on for hours with more photos. But yeah, yeah. Well. well yeah. Hopefully when we're back in person, we can uh, maybe do it again with a slightly different focus or um, something like that. That would be wonderful. Anytime. Yeah, we'd love to do it. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Anybody okay. else, any questions, any last words before we um, close up? Don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Awesome. Thanks for coming. All right. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Gary. <coughs> All right. Thanks. Wonderful. Thanks, Narda. Hey, Narda. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, it was everybody. wonderful. Yeah. All right. Well, good night, everybody. And remember that you can pick up their book um, at Iconoclast, at Chapter One, the Community Library, at Bigwood.com, and um, Amazon.com. So.